Hello. Um, so I promised myself approximately five days ago that I would start to film a YouTube video every day for my YouTube channel, and I'm doing it. And <laughs> I'm really happy to be actually disciplining myself to do this, even though it's not that big of a deal. Like, I basically told myself, even if I only make some of them, like, one minute long, um, that's fine. They can be any length of time as long as I upload something onto YouTube every day. That's my goal. And it does feel like I'm sort of creating a new like stream of energy in my life and that feels really good. It feels like I'm opening up um, new possibilities. I like the idea of beginning to feel really comfortable on camera. Um, I have so many visions involving what I would like to do in the realm of film, um, especially with people. Like, I'm actually beginning to network a lot um, with filmmakers, um, both online as well as in person. And I noticed when I was in Vancouver, um, I met quite a lot of people actually who are involved in the film industry and that that really inspired me um, the film industry is very prevalent in Vancouver so I, I, knew, I basically went there knowing that a part of my intention was to learn more about it and I wanted it to be kind of an organic process so I basically just met most of these people through through friends and just randomly um, and then I also um, did get involved with one film. I don't even know if I'm legally allowed to talk about it that much, so I, I won't, but I, it was just, um, an extra position, so I wasn't, like, um, involved in it, in the process for that long. Like, it was just a, a short, um, acting experience, but man, was it ever fun. Like, I really feel really comfortable on camera, and I really have a great deal of interest in the work and the organization that goes into making like a high quality film. Um, I went to a really unusual um, high school and public school actually. I think because I grew up in a, a very beautiful and peaceful community um, I wouldn't say it was perfect. There was a lot of racism there, and that's not a very good thing. That, that's a horrible thing, actually. Um, but for me, growing up there, um, I loved living there just because it was a peaceful place. Um, all things considered, for me, it was. And basically, I don't know if you guys have been to Toronto. Maybe somebody watching this is, I grew up in the Orangeville and Grand Valley area of Ontario, and my village um, that I grew up in has a population of about 1,500 people. I'm not actually sure if that has gone up in the past couple of years. It probably has a little bit, um, but the soil there is really thick. Like, there's a lot of clay in the earth, so it's actually, I was told that it's very expensive to develop land there, and that's one of the reasons why the population of the village has not really expanded that quickly, considering how close it is located to Toronto. It's only about an hour drive northwest of Toronto. And um, so basically for me, I can say that Toronto is my home as well. Um, a very long time ago, Grand Valley was actually called Little Toronto. That was its original name, so that's really interesting too. And um, what I love about Toronto is that it has kept its Aboriginal indigenous indigenous name, and I think that's that's really beautiful. And just the sound of Toronto, it sounds really natural and beautiful. You know, it's it's a nice name. It has something to do with water. I think the meaning of the name. Yeah, I forget, <laughs> but it's some kind of, it's it's in reference to something to do with like the nature of water or waterways or rivers or lakes or something like that. 
I'm assuming it must have something to do with rivers and lakes because that area is full of so many amazing rivers running through the lakes and into the lakes and out of the lakes and um, uh, that's why it's basically an ideal place for canoeing. So I grew up with the culture of canoeing. Canoeing was um, my life and I'm proud of that. I, I really love canoes. I also really love kayaks. I feel very at home in them. Um, to me they're just like second nature like I used to have them in my yard and I lived along the Grand River and I was um, given the freedom to just like go kayak and canoe in the river when I wanted and um, that was great and I'm, I'm really grateful for that. It was a really nice peaceful way of life and my family would often travel all over um, eastern Canada, especially Ontario and also the northeastern United States with our canoe and we had like a Volkswagen van and we'd go camping my parents and my brother and I and that was to me it just always felt like heaven to go camping I always got really excited about it and I still as an adult love to camp it's one of my favorite things to do um, I turned 37 the other day and <laughs> I'm adventurous, so I realized that there are people in the world that are not very interested in meeting new people and kind of, you know, stick to their familiar circles of friends and family, and I've never really been that type of person. Um, I do love to keep um, connected with family and friends when I can, um, but I also kind of I get bored if I'm around just the same people all the time and it's not that I would call those people boring. I, I don't feel that it's really fair to judge people as boring or not boring. But um, I just find I grow a lot when I meet new people. So in my life I have intentionally placed myself in lots of new places. Um, you know, I've traveled and I've lived in lots of different communities and in lots of different um, idyllic world-class mountain villages and I've lived in lots of beautiful islands and I've traveled uh, alone quite often. I've traveled with friends as well. I love to do that as well. Um, and I especially like traveling alone the best or with really good friends that have the same taste in music and art as me. I find if I'm, the, the most important thing is that my friends have the same taste in music as me because it's easy to be with people and, and move your eyes in different areas, but if you're in a vehicle with people and you're listening to music, you want to like the music. You want everyone in the vehicle to like the music, right? Um, <laughs> man, I could tell you guys so many stories, so I think what I'm going to try to do in the next little while is tell my life story on my YouTube channel. I know that I've done a little bit of that. Um, I've also done some singing and some rapping and some spoken word and I'll continue to do that stuff as well. And I'll try to um, label the titles so that if, you know, if someone finds my YouTube channel and they're only interested in my melody singing, then they can hopefully find that through the titles. And then if someone's just looking for rapping, they can find that through the titles. Like, I'll try to make it clear. And then I'll try to, you know, uh, mention if I'm storytelling, for example, in the title or something similar. So, um, I think this time I'm just going to tell a story. I might end up breaking into some singing at some point. We'll see. I like my singing to be natural. I don't like it to be forced. Um... I know for a fact that had I just like stayed in Toronto in my comfort zone, I probably would be like a, I, I believe that I would be a big star now um, in the music industry because the music industry basically uh, more than once opened like all the doors to me and <clears throat> everyone I knew there that, that knew anything about music was always trying to encourage me to become a big star. And even my music teacher in public school um, now, the problem <laughs> with my, my education 
experience was that when I reached grade nine, which was the first year of high school, I had to choose between music and art and, and drama. So basically we had the option to take two arts courses and not three. So I could not take drama, art, and music. And that was the most heartbreaking decision I ever had to make. I, I love equally drama, music, and art. To me, they're all interconnected and equally a part of me and my skills. Um, I've also always loved every subject except for history. And it's not to say that I don't like history. Of course, I love history. But in my school, I did not appreciate the way that history was taught because we were basically always focusing on negative things. And I mean, most of the time. And we were focusing on uh, violence, war, war battle dates, uh, war generals' names, and just like told to regurgitate all of this information that had to do with remembering who led this battle and why they were such a big hero for leading this battle where they killed a whole bunch of people. And I just always found all of that information to be very painful to even think about regurgitating. So I always passed every class very easily. Um, for some reason, I just found school to be almost too easy, but history, yeah, was never my favorite subject. Um, and even in real life, like, there are always aspects of history that come across, um, you know, my awareness, like reading about um, people that made a huge impact in the world. I think that's a really interesting type of history, like especially people that made a positive impact and people that worked really hard to um, make the world better for all people. Um, I'm really interested in reading about that kind of history, like biographies and stuff. And I love art history, like I love looking at, um, you know, really old pieces of artwork. And I love, like, archaeology. I think it's really cool. But at the same time, I like to be self-directed when I'm learning about history. <laughs> so yeah, but, um, but yeah, I remember, like, being torn between drama, art, and music. And I actually chose to omit music. And I think the reason why was because I'd already taken piano lessons, like, um, outside of school. And I'd already, I felt I could sing really well. So I didn't think that I needed lessons in music. And then also I was influenced by my parents' idea, which I disagree with now, but I think they, they meant their best when they taught me to think that, well, with music, you don't come up with a product. And with visual art, you come up with a product that you can sell. So I think you should, you know, study art instead of music. I remember them saying something like that, and it, it really, like, affected me. And now that I'm older, um, and I've done, like, all this, you know, what I would call healing and just deprogramming stuff, I think I've really taught myself to think for myself more. And even though I love... I love all the people that have tried to influence me in positive ways. You really have to think for yourself, you know? And I've, I've learned that uh, it, it was important for me to remember as an adult that music is just as much a part of me as visual art. And um, I guess it's maybe meant to be that I just learn best about music when I'm being intuitive and self-directed. And um, I love the internet music research like you can research so many amazing sides of music here and you can look up so many amazing tutorials and I love um, listening while I paint and draw I really love or while I do yoga even I love listening to um, I'm just gonna move this back because the screen is hurting my eyes yeah I'll put it here um, I love listening to interviews um, that are done with artists that I really admire. I've watched so many Tom York interviews. I met him in a sense, like not through verbal means, and I had no desire to talk when I met him, but I basically went to one of his shows in a really small 
warehouse once. I've mentioned this, I think, before on my YouTube channel, so I won't talk about it for too long, but um, I was, like, being airlifted in this crowd full of, like, really amazing, positive people um, in a warehouse. It was kind of like a warehouse rave. It was my first real concert that I went to, um, at least where I was choosing. I don't know, I may have gone to a concert before that, but I don't remember. Um, it's the first concert I really remember, and it was more like a rave. It was just like a bunch of us dancing on a dance floor in a warehouse in Mississauga, like just outside of Toronto. And, um, I think I was 15 or 14 or something. It was like 1993. And, yeah, I, I loved that experience so much. I was like four feet away from Tom York with eye contact all night. Like, we literally had eye contact for most of the night. And I felt like he could kind of see that I was, you know, a similar type of spirit. I know I was reading his spirit. I was like, oh my god, this guy. His spirit is, like, as free as mine. He's basically, like, in my mind, the whole show was just saying, like, you can do this, you know. and You can just, like, be yourself and, like, screw anyone that, like, tries to pressure you into being something that you're not because the world's full of that right the world is like full of followers and people that just blindly follow other people out of fear and doubt and just doubt their spirits and doubt their dreams and that's become what's normal and like widely accepted by people it's just hilarious like it's crazy so I'm very proud of myself because you know in my life I feel that I've always been strong in terms of like listening to my own intuition and my own heart. And so I feel like my goal in life, my biggest goal in life is to make the most positive impact possible. And that that's internal, but it's also external. I think, you know, the microcosm is the macrocosm. So everything we experience in our own life is just naturally also emitted into the universe and into the world around us and into the collective consciousness that we all share, right? So I feel it's really it's really liberating to be aware of the collective consciousness. And it, it also gives you a sense of responsibility, you know? Because I think when you remember that that what I do influences and affects what you do. And what I feel energetically and how I vibrate and how I take care of my health and everything that I do, it's, it's influencing how you feel to some degree, you know? And so, yeah, like, <laughs> I could go on and on about so many subjects. It's so easy for me to talk. So, um, I am a little bit tired right now, I'll be honest. Um, I was tempted to just go to sleep. I don't know if you can hear that, but my cat's like running around. <laughs> She's really funny. She gets really excited when I record or film myself. And it's really interesting. I think cats are very wise beings. And um, I think they're really in tune with like energy and the universe and like cosmic consciousness I don't know if you can see her there she's not that lit up but um yeah this is shadow she she looks like a shadow she's like dark and she's very fun most of the time and occasionally she uh doesn't let me pet her occasionally but usually she does so that's good um She's like me. She, she likes her space when she's in the mood to have her space and, like, won't let anyone touch her. But then she also likes to huddle and stuff sometimes, too, and, like, hang out. And she loves it when I paint. Like, she goes nuts when I paint. She's in heaven, basically. And she'll, like, move her body and her head with the movements that I make with my paintbrush and with like sometimes I'll just take a can of paint and like splash it all over like you know move my hands and sway my hands and stuff and she'll literally like move her head like with the motions <laughs> it's 
so amazing. No, she's a very, very amazing cat, and I'm very grateful to have her out here in the forest in my cabin. So this cabin is very different from all of the other cabins that I've ever lived in. I've lived in quite a few amazing, amazing cabins that have also been turned into art studios by me, or some of them were already art studios before I moved into them. And um, the main difference between this one and all the ones that I have lived in before is that this one is not really in the type of community where I would choose to live if this was not on my parents land. So the reason why I'm here is because my dad invited me to live here a few years ago. I never live here all the time. I come and go. Um, but basically he showed me this place. He, he called me up when I was living in the Rocky Mountains in Jasper and he said, Amy, I have this, I have an art studio for you. And I was like, Oh my gosh, really? I was like paying so much money to pay rent in Jasper and I was happy there. I had a, a great circle of friends there and I had like amazing work. Like I just worked a little bit in a health food store and a little bit at a backpackers hostel. It was kind of like a hostess front desk agent. It was really chill and really fun. And then I had a lot of time to just like explore the outdoors and I wrote a lot of poetry and I did a bit of painting there but I did more like poetry actually which is interesting um and just exploring nature and um yeah it was like I didn't really have a plan to move back to the west coast but my dad um and my mom bought this place at the time this was like 2008 in the fall and it was interesting because they bought this place just when I was um, dancing at the Shambhala Music Festival. And I can definitely say in 2008, that was my most intense Shambhala ever. I've gone to Shambhala so many times and I've been very involved like behind the scenes in many ways as a visual artist, as a singer, and also as a dancer professionally. And I've never rapped there on stage. I just realized that. I've only sang in a microphone there. But I've done a lot of rapping just like around on the dance floor. <laughs> like, and, and in the river and stuff. Um, but that's interesting. That I'll have to rap there someday like on a microphone. That will probably be very interesting. I notice um, it's a white person festival basically. There's like hardly any, you know, there's mostly just white people there and it's interesting because the only two people at Shambhala who've trusted me to improvisationally take the microphone and be improvised, like to, to have the freedom to improvise, were two black people. And like, I don't even really believe in race and I don't even really believe that that we're different if we have different color of skin at all. Like, I mean, believe what you want. I'm not here to impose what I feel, but I feel like race is just a myth according to what I understand. Like, I feel like so connected to everybody equally as a human being with arms and legs and eyes and heart, you know. And I just feel like um, I don't want to associate my, myself with someone because they have the same color of skin with me more than someone that doesn't. Or, or even like I don't want to associate myself more with someone that has the same color of eyes than me with someone that doesn't. Like it's just those, those factors to me are just irrelevant. And I just feel like the earth is full of different weather patterns. And naturally, there are some people that travel more and some people that travel less. And some people that are just exposed to very different weather patterns. So I think, like, the different tones and colors of our skin and hair and everything, and eyes and everything, I think is just the result of different weather patterns. And, and I mean, you can also look at it as, you know, God or whatever you want to call the great spirit or just the beauty of nature. Um, kind of has like a paintbrush as far as I can see and like 
naturally it's just beautiful to see people with different colors just like it is beautiful to see paintings with different colors you know and like I just think everyone is like so beautiful to me and, and I feel so such a deep connection with humanity as a whole I've always felt this way since I was a kid I've always just felt so connected to everybody and I notice um I do feel a little bit little bit of pain like off the surface when people don't feel it back you know because a lot of people are really like focusing on separation and like um how we're all these different entities that are like not connected and I think that's really unnatural like I think it's really natural to feel connected to whatever's around like wherever you are and to want to to love as much as possible that's what I feel or to be as kind as possible I think that's just like natural but that's my idea anyway I don't know I, I shouldn't pretend to be like a perfect saint because like I do have my moments where I'm mean you know especially like family members if I'm tired and they try to talk to me when I'm like just waking up in the morning that's when I'm evil like I'm literally like evil like I <laughs> I used to like yell at anyone who would try to wake me up before I was ready to wake up. I still do not like that. And it's interesting, out in this cabin, I've um, I've tried to bring a few alarm clocks in here and they always break. And when I put a watch on, I can usually wear it for, like if I'm borrowing someone's watch, because like say today, for example, I borrowed my mother's watch because I, took her to her yoga class and then I had to remember to um, pick her up at a specific time and I went for a walk along the ocean while I was uh, waiting and basically she suggested that I take her watch so that I remembered to be there you know at the right time and I wore her watch and it was fine the time remained normal but I noticed if I wear a watch for a few days especially um, five to seven days, it just breaks, it breaks, like it breaks down. <laughs> it's my frequency, like I have this crazy frequency. Supposedly, there are statistics about this, and I'd like to research this more, but supposedly a small percentage of humans have this frequency where we can't wear a watch, like it literally breaks. But for me, Whatever this is seems to be very intense because I can't even have an alarm clock sitting near me or it breaks. And I had an iPod Touch this year for the first time I bought um, my first Wi-Fi device that is portable. I've always tried to avoid those things because I'm just, I'm kind of a minimalist sometimes. I'm also a bit of a chameleon, but... Um, in my adult life, I've been quite a minimalist, and just because I like traveling, it's, like, easier sometimes to not have a whole bunch of stuff. I don't know, that might change, but, um, a lot of my ideas are changing right now. I'm, like, really opening my mind to so many new ideas. But, um, I guess I've noticed that even with my iPod Touch, my alarm would often break down. But the rest of the iPod Touch, all of the functions within that little computer would always work perfectly. And the clock would always work, which is amazing to me. So, but that kind of clock is very different from, you know, this kind of clock. Oh, I can't, I can't do this. I'll show you. You know, these things, these alarm clocks, they're... <laughs> Yes, I'm in bed, whatever, no big deal, right? I'm just sitting here. Um, these kind of alarm clocks always break down on me when I try, especially, like, not so much just for keeping the time, but when I try to set them to wake me up. So I've learned, like, the nature of my natural rhythms have basically taught me through my experience, through very clear experiences, that I am most balanced when I'm spontaneous for most of the time. And I question this with like, you know, my love of performance 
and how am I going to manage to perform and to perform music and to build albums, you know, which are very, like, structured, and how am I going to do all this? And, like, sometimes I think, well, because now I'm finally really interested in sharing my life with people more. For a long time, I was just interested in being a hermit and painting in the woods and, like, doing some art shows here and there and traveling just into the unknown and, like, focusing on building my skills. And now that I'm a little bit older, I'm thinking, I have to give back. I want to give my heart to the earth. I want to give my heart to the people of the earth, you know, as best I can. And I want to do it in a professional way. But there's so much in the professional world of being an artist that does not resonate with me. And because I know myself so well now, <laughs> I didn't know what to think about this when I was younger. I just avoided, avoided the idea of being a public, you know, person. Um, oh, running low on battery power. Okay, I have to get a cord for my computer because it's running out of battery power. Okay, I just plugged it in. I'm just, uh using this nice little, um, what's it called, MacBook Air. These things are amazing. They're so light and they work so well for how small they are. I think the design is quite amazing. Of course, there's always room for improvement with everything, but all things considered, I love this little machine. I love Apple. I love the company Apple. Um, I love what I've seen of the plans for the new Apple headquarters. It's like a circle with a big circular, um, what do you call it, like a courtyard within it. And that that's cool because, um, yeah, I've always liked courtyards and I've always liked circular buildings. So I'd like to visit it and I have visions of what I'd like to do there when I visit it. I'd basically like to like say to the heads of Apple, like, you guys should hire me to paint something for you because I would be so delighted to do that because Apple products have definitely influenced my life in quite a big way since 2012, since I bought my first iMac, which was my first computer ever. And, um, yeah, loved my iPod Touch until I lost it recently. I was so upset when I lost it. I don't I don't know how I lost it exactly, but the last time I remember holding it, I was hiking up a mountain, a pretty big mountain, and I think I lost it on the trail. Went back to the trail, did the hike again, looked all over for it, but yeah, I was like looking for a needle in a haystack, so I'm pretty sad about that. Um being an artist and supporting myself independently, buying all my own supplies, funded by myself, um, is challenging sometimes. And I, I'm aware that I've created a lot of my own challenges. Like, I have been offered multiple million dollar opportunities, which would have inevitably led to fame and fortune, and I've turned them all down. But the funny thing is, is that I know my spirit and I understand the stars and like I understand the intelligence of the universe. And I do feel that, um, well, since I was a kid, I pretty much felt that fame is kind of inevitable for me. And I think it's just like my friends and my peers in school um, always noticed that like as a kid, I really loved every subject pretty much except for history sometimes but I I really loved the arts I really loved acting and I really loved um, anything creative you know and I think I think that every subject is a part of creativity anything can be combined like for example scientists and artists can create incredible things together and a lot of the um, the rooms in museums are collaborations between scientists and artists, you know. So there's really no separation between anything unless you choose to create it. 
but yeah, that's that's a big subject. Anyway, I'm talking here in such a funny mood. I'm seriously like, I could just fall asleep right now, but I love doing this so much and I'm so excited about my YouTube channel because I'm finally, finally disciplining myself to put energy into it every day and I know that will open doors. I know it will. So it feels really new. I just feel like I'm carving something, like a niche here. I'm like cutting the edge. <laughs> it's so exciting. So I love um, the magic of the internet. I've experienced so many amazing opportunities um, through just like online networking. And I've expanded my awareness of what's possible thanks to all of you guys. Like it's just so meaningful for me to be able to look at um, photographs of art being done, you know, in every country. And and it's so inspiring to see um, the correlations between what I have, for example, painted yesterday versus what you have painted yesterday. And to notice sometimes, like, interesting patterns. Like, sometimes I'll literally be thinking about something... And then I go to my Facebook homepage to do some rhyming. I really love typing in um, spontaneous rhymes into my Facebook status updates. And I think that's why I've got so many friends and followers on there. I don't, I don't have as many followers as some people, but I'm getting a fair amount. And um, yeah, I just love it. I love communicating my truth. And naturally, it's very easy for me to just write lyrics in the moment at any given time. This is extremely easy for me because I've been doing it since I was able to talk. Like for me, writing a song lyric is just as easy as crafting a sentence. Sometimes it's maybe easier, but then I also realize that any sentence that I speak could also easily be turned into a song lyric, you know? And in a sense, if you look at the word universe and cut it Cut it up at the end of U and I. So you see U and I and verse, V E R S E, it kind of represents one song. Un uni is kind of like representative of the number one. Unity, too. No, uni sounds like unity. It also sounds like unicorn. Um, and then verse is what makes up a song. Right? So, like, the universe kind of is one song. And if you're willing to look at life that way, and if you're willing to see how it all intertwines like a song and how it's all harmonious when you're willing to recognize the harmonious nature of how we are all connected as human beings, of how our biology is completely one with the biology of the magical earth of how our consciousness is all connected how our, our thoughts are so powerful it's just it's a magical time to be here is basically what I'm saying and I'm sorry if I started telling some stories and went on a tangent and started telling other stories instead if that bothers you ask me like if I <laughs> I'm sure I was starting to talk about something and then went on a tangent. But if, if you have questions for me, ask me. Contact me on Facebook or ask me here in the comments. And I'll do my best to respond. And um, I always do my best to respond to all messages that I receive. It's not always easy because sometimes I get a lot of messages. Um... But I notice intention is a very powerful force and sometimes I just, if I'm getting too many messages and then I'm not able to like, you know, spend more time away from the computer than I'd like. <laughs> I do love computers. Um, I'll just set the intention. I'll say, okay universe, I want less messages, more concise, more simple, more important. And I mean everything's important, but you know. Sometimes certain messages are more important than others and more um, well, more focused, I guess, or more um, clear. 
like some some of the message I some of the messages that I send on Facebook are just silly and I'm so silly <laughs> like I'm so spontaneous and I love the fact that I have a free spirit but sometimes I'll write something just to one of my friends and then I'll think about it an hour later and I'll be like did I just really say that <laughs> like it's crazy but I am the same in person believe it or not like if you ever notice online that I'm a little bit silly um that's good because you're catching my actual behavior like I'm very silly and I'm very hilarious and I don't take things overly seriously that often and then once in a while I find myself in a mood where I take things overly seriously like when I'm really sensitive I'm, I'm always sensitive but I take everything with a grain of salt and when it comes to my own actions I'm just hilarious like I just I just fall and I stumble and I make the craziest mistakes on purpose just so that I can actually be doing something so that I can actually grow so that I can actually like prove to myself that I'm fearless that I'm as fearless as I choose to be that I'm as creative and eccentric as I choose to be because I don't want to be a sheep because I don't want to be a follower because I don't want to just fit in and be like everyone else you know, I just, I don't. Like, that would be so boring. <laughs> um, so a friend, I was talking to a friend, uh, a very strong producer friend who makes music, um, bass music. You know, I'm pretty obsessed with all kinds of music, music with and without bass I love, but I always gravitate back to bass for some reason. Um... I'm one of those, you know, kind of like fairy people. If there's like a bass music party, I'm like, I'm going insane. And I'm just like giving my all to like the moment. And I'm just like letting loose and like creating the most crazy ninja dance moves. And like going hard. Like I go, I have so much energy and I just love to dance. And I love to just throw my ego into the fire when I dance and just like kill my ego. And then when I find it again, I just kill it. And like that's what's going on in my head. I'm just like killing my ego. And it's just the most fun thing ever. And I love it. I've danced on every stage at the Shyamala Music Festival for years. And I've also, um, I've done, I've danced a lot of festivals on stages where I wasn't even hired as a dancer and people just like invited me up and then, cause, because my dance moves are crazy, they kind of speak for themselves. And then I've also, um, been invited backstage at random, like at the Gorge in Washington, um, in the States, one of the most amazing venues ever. I went to like a fish festival there when I was like 19 and I remember like, because my dancing was like so crazy and wild, I literally like was like flying. This was my first time traveling alone. I was so happy. It was with some friends, but like without my family. I was just like so feeling so free. And yeah, I ended up like backstage hanging out with fish. <laughs> they were like so cool. But but the thing at a fish show is like meeting fish is no big deal because everyone at the show is really interesting. And everyone's got, like, this, like, connection with nature and with their own mind and with arts. And, like, it's really an interesting place. So I remember noticing that, like, when I was backstage, I actually remember hanging my, my arms, like, over this gate. And I was, like, connecting with the people on the other side of the gate. And they were like, oh, we wish we were you right now. And I hate it when people say that because it's so strange silly and senseless like you should never wish that you're somebody else because that means you're like to me it means that you're ignoring the benefit of being you and like your own unique gifts and like everybody has unique gifts that are equally valuable nobody has more value than you and the biggest flaw in modern culture has been putting people on pedestals where you're giving them too much energy. You're, you're, I mean, it's good to let different people sing on a stage and it's good to listen to different people speak and to give them your attention. But you don't want to, like, you don't want to, like, pretend that they're more important than you. 
that's the flaw. When, when people think that someone else is more important, that's just wrong, you know? And I think it's that flaw that creates a lot of suffering on the planet for so many people and for so many animals. So I think it's really important for us right now to remember that it's liberating to realize that we're all powerful and that we all have potential to become incredible and, and to realize our own unique individuality that is incredible when we actually pay attention to it. And when we listen to our heart and when we allow ourselves to guide ourselves and, and to really just listen to, well, what is it that makes me feel really good? And how can I figure out how to do that a lot? And how can I figure out how to share that in ways that add value to culture, you know? For me, art has always been about that and music has always been about that. It's really about what can I, what can I give? How can I serve? You know, how can I inspire others to love life? And how can I show them that I love life? And how can I, how can I represent my love of every moment? And how can I refine that? And how can I continue to refine it until it becomes more and more perfected? And like, at the age of 37, even though I do not believe in age, and I don't even really base my life on the intelligence that's held within the box of the Gregorian calendar, because I do think we're going through a shift right now, and I think those of us who are in tune with it are catching these like new frequencies, you know, our DNA is being upgraded as much as we allow it. And I think if we're like doing the work and taking care of our health and like, um, doing, you know, all kinds of healing modalities, like energy healing. I'm, oh, I'm an energy healer. Um, that's another thing. If you ever want a session over Skype or something, or if you want to come and meet me in person, I love, I love energy healing. And I now charge for it. For years I didn't because I, I just didn't feel ready to do that. I wanted to just give it for free. It, it just felt like the best way to, to practice it. And I, I put it into everything I do. I put it into this and I put it into, you know, my art and my music and everything. Um, to my poems, everything. Because everything I do is aimed at one thing, which is healing the world. Or, I don't know if healing the world is even the best word. Just like making the most positive impact I can. You know. Yeah, I'd say healing the world is the same thing. Um, because when everyone feels encouraged to make the most positive impact they can, um, I think that's just really the natural way of being, is to want to, like, impact things in a positive way. And I think if you think you don't, you're just not being natural. It's really my core belief. Um, I think that when everyone, like, is encouraged to really be their authentic selves and, like, to discover, like, how fun it is to meditate and be wholesome and, and to feel good and to enjoy nature and to feel the connectedness in our collective consciousness, I feel like when everyone awakens to the benefit of all, all this kind of stuff, I think the earth will heal very quickly um, as if we're watching a movie. Like, I have visions about this all the time. I really feel that the earth is not doomed. <laughs> the earth is fine. And I even used to struggle about this. Like, since I was a kid, I've been very sensitive towards the state of nature. And I, I used to worry, and I used to tell my brother, you know, Mike, I'm, I'm really worried about Mother Earth because, like, all these people are just hurting her, you know? And, like, we lived in a small village where we saw a field turn into a gravel pit close to our house and we heard all this crushing of like machines crushing stones and like digging holes and like mother earth so the pavement could be made for the city you know and for like a year or something like our house was just covered in inches of dust 
because we were so close to this gravel pit. And that was devastating for me, especially when it started. And then eventually it, it, the, the sound and all of that energy moved on, thank God. But it was just horrible for me. That, was, that field was where I used to cross-country ski in the winters. And it was a beautiful rolling field. And to see it just turn into this pit of, like, doom and darkness with men and machines that weren't very friendly. <laughs> it was just not the same as, like, having a farm field owned by people we knew. You know, these were people from the city that we didn't know that weren't, weren't as nice as the small town people. <laughs> I have a very open mind. I love urban culture and I love my friends that, like, grew up in cities. But it's... There's definitely a part of me, as much as I travel and explore, that will always be Amy Frith from Grand Valley, Ontario. And, you know, I'll always have this village essence in my life where, like, you know, you grow up in a small village, you'll always have that. You always have that, that consciousness where you see how your actions really ripple out into the community and what goes around comes around fast in a small village and the way you treat others really does come back to you because everyone basically knows everything about everyone and everyone knows everything that you do and like I I'm glad that I always did my best to be a good person there you know I had really good experience and there were times when I never wanted to leave because I just I loved loved living there so much it was, it was a really beautiful place but when I found out that a lot of people were racist because one of my brother's best friends that was black um, told my family, he was like, you guys are like the only people that ever treated me like human beings throughout my life here. You know, when we were adults, we were all home visiting. Like, I just realized then that, okay, this this isn't as fairy tale as I, as I pretend it is or as I perceive it to be, you know, um, there was, there were some problems there for sure. So, so yeah, that's one thing I love about Toronto. Um, Toronto is very advanced, I would say, in terms of multiculturalism. Like, it's just so natural there to see every type of person from everywhere in the world together at one table. You know, and I just love that. I, just, I value that so much. I think that's the future. And I think to interact with that is so beneficial because you can learn so much from, like, everyone from every country and from every background and from every walk of life. There's just so much to learn from everyone, you know? And I, I just love being open to that. I, I love being open to seeing the beauty in, in everyone. And, and of course, like some people have done things that, that have been very, you know, um, dark. But I think for me, it's like, it's important to forgive people. And it's important to realize like, there's always a reason why people are the way they are. And yeah, so I was going to talk about money. A friend, I was going to start mentioning this. Um, a friend mentioned to me, I asked him, what should I talk about in this video? Oh, shoot. I'm going to do that tomorrow. Tomorrow I'm going to talk about money or the next day, sometime soon when I feel like it. Um, because money is a big subject. So yeah, I asked this guy, like, what should I talk about? And he was like, money. And I said, okay, I will. And then I kind of forgot. Um, but... <laughs> Wait, that's okay. I'm tired. I'm just amazed that I managed to do this and uh, talk for this long. Wow. So, yeah. Um, here's another session of Amy Frith talking about life randomly. And I hope you enjoy. And, yeah, feel free to, like, ask me questions. Um have like a creative idea of a project you might like to work on with me I'm all ears I have a lot of things planned but I also like to always leave some room for flexibility no matter what I get um, involved with and that's why I love painting and, and singing and dancing so much because like it's all so flexible 
you know, I can listen to what I feel in the moment and I can arrange things in a very natural way. And it's very nice. It was like freedom. And I really wish to encourage more people to enjoy freedom. I think you have to create it from within. You know, nobody's going to give it to you. We so often expect politicians to give us freedom. And then when we don't have it, we blame it on politicians. But that's not fair. Like, we have to take responsibility as people to really make an impact in the world. You know, each of us is making such a huge impact all the time. And I think when we, like, pay attention to that and do our best to uh, to give the best we can to the world and to ourselves, then, then we receive um, miracles, basically, you know. So I wish you all the best always in your life. And I care about you because you're part of the human family. And in my opinion, humanity is a family. I think that's a very simple, obvious fact. See ya.